when declassification is appropriate, and what supports may be available after a student is declassified. Um, this will include school district, parent, guardian, and student perspectives on the declassification process. So joining us today to present on this topic are um, two incredible ladies. Michelle Myla from uh, Shenandoah is the director of special education in that district. And I don't know if you can see her, but she's got her headset on. She's waving now, ready to go. And also Julie Keegan, who is uh, also a member of our council and a member of the New York State Council, uh, the special ed task force at the state level. Julie is the director of protection and advocacy for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities for Disability Rights New York. So I'm going to mute myself and let the two of you take it away. Well, thank you, Sherry, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am realizing that I will be queuing Helen to switch the slides. Is that right, Helen? That is correct. Okay, let's go to the next slide then, please. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, Julie and I actually started working on this presentation last year, and then when COVID struck, uh, it was canceled. Uh, we never actually met in person, so we did this all through Google, which is now the thing to do. So thank you for, um, in advance for any, um, I guess, missteps as we co-present. Uh, we are going to jump in and out and clarify and explain with each other as we go through this, as um, you know, we all come with a different perspective and experience. So we thought that we would start by reviewing the process um, of classification, which begins with the initial referral to CSE. And students are referred to the Committee on Special Education when they are not meeting grade level expectations in school, uh, and they are not responding to general education interventions. And for those of you who are not in this, in, um, involved in special education yet, but may be thinking that uh, your child may require special education at some point, it's very important to know that um, a student must go through a series of research-based interventions prior to being identified as a student with a disability. And that is because we want to rule out that the student has had the appropriate, or we want to rule in that the student has had the appropriate instruction that they need to make progress, close skill gaps, and ensure that they um, that they are truly a student who has a disability rather than um, requiring remediation. And then the student uh, to be considered for classification uh, needs to meet one of the 13 disability categories. Next slide, please. Um, can I jump in here? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, you know, it wasn't my um, understanding that a child had to go through RTI or another um, lesser intervention before being able to be referred to the CSE. Um, it's my understanding that a child could be referred at any time um, and does need to be evaluated if, if they consent to an evaluation. So I don't think that process gets delayed by That's the fact that... Yeah, so that's I just a, wanted to clarify. That's all. Yes, that's a great point, Julie. A parent has the right to um, refer their child for an evaluation at any time. And if a child hasn't gone through uh, the RTI process, that cannot delay the evaluation. Um, and, and it is often uh, something that we look more closely at when we're looking at a speech and language impairment or a learning disability. Um, however, the Part 100 regulations do indicate that um, pre-referral interventions need to be attempted and implemented prior to, or considered prior to classification. So there are always exceptions. Um, for instance, we have had students move into the district who um, may not have had 
good formal education or any formal education, and clearly that student, let's say, has autism. We are not going to put that child through a response to intervention process. It's really more when we're looking at students who have, as I said, a potential learning disability, a potential speech and language impairment, um, some type of condition where we really need to rule out that the child does not have a skill gap or that the child has not received the appropriate instruction to um, close a gap. And again, a parent can always refer their child, but that is something that will be discussed. Did that make more sense, Julie? Yeah, that's totally it. It's yeah. It's certainly part of the discussion in determining whether a child's eligible. Do we want to try some other interventions first or not? But but at the bottom line, if the parent says, no, I don't want to try to. Yes. And, and the district says, well, we don't have enough information to find the, the, the child eligible. Then the parent would have you know, the right to challenge that decision. Um, hopefully it wouldn't get to that point. But um, it's certainly I agree with you when there's when it's when it's a fuzzier area or we don't have a lot of information about a child, it might be helpful to see how they do um, with just supports that would be available to anybody. Right, correct. Okay, so um, IDEA, which is the federal guidelines, uh, eligibility determination is, may be considered, will be considered after a comprehensive evaluation and a, an evaluation, the key components and the required components by New York State include a psychoeducational evaluation, which is completed by a school psychologist and includes a cognitive assessment. It includes individual academic achievement assessment. Uh, and it also includes rating scales. Those might be to measure a student's adaptive skills. Uh, it may be their social, emotional, and behavioral skills. Uh, and there may be other individual components based on the reason for the referral to special education. Uh, the other components include a social history, and that is something that a parent completes. Uh, it can be a form or it can be an interview. Um, a classroom observation of the student is required, and that is one of the um, areas we really struggled with uh, during the COVID school closure because um, you, uh, the school psychologist or other member of the CSE, not the classroom teacher, needs to complete that classroom observation so they can see exactly what is going on with that child during instruction. And then the fourth required component is a physical. Um, I think many schools do what we do, and that is if we have a physical evaluation on file from within the last two years, that is acceptable. Um, however, sometimes we need an updated physical. And the purpose for that is to uh, ensure that we are looking at potential hearing issues, potential vision issues, uh, and any other type of health condition that might impact the student's learning that might not necessarily be a lifelong disability, but may be something that we can address. And then there are also sometimes supplemental evaluations based on the referral question. For instance, you may your child may need a speech and language evaluation, a physical therapy evaluation, an occupational uh, therapy evaluation, et cetera. So those individual evaluations are determined through consultation, typically between the school psychologist and the parent to determine um, what exactly the concerns are. And then for school age students, so any student age three to 21 is eligible to be evaluated by the Committee on Preschool or School Age Special Education. Uh, if a student is three between three and five, and they are not yet kindergarten eligible, then their classification, if they qualify, would be a preschooler with a disability. If the student is in kindergarten and could be up to 21, if they have not earned a high school diploma, they would have to meet the criteria for one of the 13 categories that are outlined by New York State. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. Okay, so when we have had that initial classification meeting and the student meets the criteria to be classified, we then develop what is called an IEP, an individual education plan. And you can see the key components of that IEP include a description of the student's present levels of performance in cognitive, academic, social, emotional, and physical development, there is a section called management needs, 
and management needs outlines the key areas, environmental, human, and material resources that are needed for the student to have access to the education and also to provide that specialized instruction that they need. The student has individual goals that um, are intended to be met within one calendar year. That often gets tricky because if a student has an annual review in January, we are actually, you know, to plan for the next year's IEP, we are planning for those goals to be started in September and ended in June, unless your district does what we call anniversary IEPs, which means that the IEP is a calendar year. So I don't know, Sherry, do, I don't know if your district does anniversary IEPs. We do not um, at Shenandoah because we do standards-based IEPs, which means that we are looking at what are the grade level standards for the next year coming up? What is the student's area of need and how do we build an IEP to ensure that the student has access to those standards during that school year? We also have programs and services on an IEP, um, special education programming, such as resource room, consultant, teacher, special class. Um, we also have related services, speech, OT, PT. Uh, there's a section for testing accommodations, which are very important, and we'll talk more about that as we talk about declassification. Uh, transportation, does your child require any specialized transporta transportation accommodations? Uh, specialized instruction will outline in the programs and services exactly what uh, the format of the specialized instruction will be for your child each day. So the resource room service, which can be in or out, but is a five to one ratio designed for reteaching, pre-teaching and specialized skill instruction, or does your child require co uh, consultant teaching, which is in the classroom and providing that specialized instruction during general education instruction etc. Um, and each IEP is reviewed at least one time a year and can be reviewed as often as needed as requested by the team or the parent. And the purpose of the IEP and special education is for, a, for the student to have meaningful educational benefit. So we used to have educational benefit, which was the Rowley standard, and now it's meaningful educational benefit. So to ensure that each student with an IEP is making progress based on their um, current levels and that they are working towards um, a meaningful outcome as we look to exit from special education. Next slide, please. And here is the process uh, laid out in a visual. So you can see um, on your left, the initial referral, then the evaluation, then we have the IEP meeting and we implement the IEP. Within one year of the implementation and of the last annual review, we have an annual review meeting. And then every three years, minimally, we have what's called a reevaluation meeting. Next slide, please. So the reevaluation meeting occurs at least every three years. Sometimes uh, special education does wonderful things and we declassify a student before, or we look to have a reevaluation for another reason. Perhaps we want to, uh, the child hasn't made the progress in one or two years. Usually it would be closer to two years. And we want to reevaluate what is going on with that child. And it, um, it can happen at the request of the school or the parent. A reevaluation, like an initial, is completed by a multidisciplinary team. So that meeting, that reevaluation meeting, will include your child's teacher, your child's special education teacher, the school psychologist, the district representative, you, your child, if your child is. Um, old enough to participate or if they would like to participate or you would like them to participate and any other related service providers who provide services to your child. And the purpose of that reevaluation is always when we're looking at Committee on Special Education meetings to identify your child's individual needs, to look at their educational progress within the general ed curriculum 
or the specialized curriculum and to evaluate their current levels of achievement. We're also looking at, whoops, sorry, your child's ability to participate in the instructional program because we're always looking at least restrictive environment and we want all students to be uh, in regular education classes as much as possible based on their needs as they work towards that regular high school diploma or a New York State alternate assessment. And then most importantly, we're looking at does your child still require specialized instruction in order to have access to and progress in the New York State standards. Next slide, please. Okay, so classification determin declassification determination. So when we complete that reevaluation, there are multiple components of the reevaluation. Uh, usually there is some psychological um, psychoeducational updated assessment, but we're, we're really looking at, does the student require special education service in order to progress in the standards? And what special education is, is specialized instruction based on the student's disability. Uh, and does that child need that instruction that is focused on teaching a student a skill or a strategy for them to access the curriculum. And this determination, again, is made by the Committee on Special Education. So you are part as a parent of that committee. Everybody is getting together and having a discussion about where is the child functioning and what do they need in order to progress. Hey, can I jump in here? Please. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice if you were looking at the slide, <clears throat> it said this is the goal with an exclamation point. And I, I think I might have added that, Michelle. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but I, I did want to, I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, I've been uh, working with parents on special ed matters um, for a really long time now. And um, this idea of declassification can be very scary to parents um, because these are necessary supports. In many instances, you may have had to learn a whole lot of advocacy skills and learn a whole lot about special education in order to um, make sure that your child is getting the services they want. Um, and it's it's been hard. And in some cases, it's been contentious. Um, and you know, hopefully that's the purpose of the task force is to try to you know, minimize and minimize contention and improve um, communication. But I put, this is the goal because really the goal of special education is to not need special education anymore. If we can provide the right supports and sufficient supports to make that child make progress, then we really want to be in a position where that child no longer needs those services. So I think it's just really important that we're always keeping that in mind. And while it may be scary, it's like going into the deep end without a you know life vest for the first time, whatever. That's why, in fact, there are declassification services, which Michelle's going to talk about now. But I just I want to plant that seed because really we want to get to this point where we don't need special education anymore. Thank you, Julie. That that's great, and we're going to talk about. Um, supports and long-term, um, but I, I often say to parents in CSC meetings, our goal is for students to be as independent as possible because when they exit high school, there is not going to be anyone holding their hand and telling them you have to go to resource room or this is your schedule. Um, so our goal is, is independence. And as we work towards independence, we are ideally working towards declassification. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, in order, prior to a student being declassified, the district must complete an evaluation. And this is an area that can be confusing. Um, and often many of our school staff struggle with this because a, a reevaluation or an evaluation um, through the reevaluation process does not necessarily require a full battery of individualized assessments. Um, what we do 
in our district is when we have students who are due for reevaluation, our psychologist is going to look at all of the students information and determine, do they need an updated cognitive assessment? Do they need to come and have individual academic achievement testing? They're going to have a conversation with your child's teachers and they're going to have a conversation with you and say, um, your child is due for reevaluation or your, we believe your child um, should be reevaluated to determine whether or not they still require classification. And here's what we think we need to make that decision. Sometimes it's a review of records. Uh, if your child is receiving 90s in their classes and they've met their IEP goals and the resource room or consultant teacher says, yes, this student is completely independent. They don't require resource room support. They're just coming to my room and they're completely independent. Then that's a conversation that should take place between you and your child's case manager and school psychologist. But there has to be a reevaluation meeting. And prior to that reevaluation meeting, you have to receive notice that the meeting is going to occur. And here's what we're going to base our, or here's what we're looking to base our decision on. And you have an opportunity to say, you know, no, I, I would like this type of testing. I would like some individual academic testing. I would like updated cognitive testing, cognitive testing. So you are really part of that um, decision about what will go into that reevaluation. And the district has to provide a copy of the reevaluation, whether that is a formal full reevaluation assessment, whether that is a psychological consult and the psychologist summarizes what they did to come to this determination, or it could be the prior written notice that you will receive from the meeting saying, we are re recommending declassification and here are the reasons why. And here is the data that we are basing that recommendation on. Next slide, please. Okay, now when we say a student is eligible or should be declassified or we're making that recommendation, we then want to determine, does your child require support services? and or does your child require testing accommodations? So, and this is our transition service, declassification support services. So if your child is recommended for, uh, let's say your child's receiving resource room, they're recommended for declassification. The committee may agree that as we go through the next school year, your child may require resource room as a declassification support to ensure that they are really and truly independent. Um, we often look at this type of support when we're going from one level to another. So you may have a student in eighth grade who is being recommended for declassification. They're going to another building, they're going into high school and the committee may say, really, we think that Johnny should have a year of declass support in the area uh, that would be provided through resource room to help ensure that they are truly able to function independently as they go to that next level. Um, often, uh, especially with older students, we will also see that students require testing accommodations as a declassification support. So um, if you have a student who has had uh, extended time because they require that in order to show everything they know on tests, then that can be a support that your child not only receives for the next year, but can receive throughout high school or throughout middle school and high school. The process that we use is every single year, we have our school psychologist and case manager review all of our declassification, all of our declassified students who receive testing accommodations, and they have a conversation with the case manager, sometimes the student, our testing room aides, and the parent about whether or not that student still requires that testing accommodation. So that's something that we review every year. We document it. And again, the reason for that is we want to ensure the student needs it. And if the student doesn't need it, they're more independent and we wanna recognize that they don't need that accommodation anymore. So we do that for all of our students right up through graduation. 
And also as a declassification support, your student may require um, for the one year program modifications. Perhaps uh, we're going to write, we want to ensure that they have preferential seating for that next school year or a copy of class notes. So all of those things are discussed by the CSE because we want to make sure that as your child transitions out of special education, that they have the supports that they need to be successful, especially that first year. Okay, so again, we are looking at what services, if any, your child may need to um, be successful for that first year during declassification. As I said, sometimes resource room is recommended. Sometimes it's consultant teacher because that consultant teacher can check in with the student and with um, their teachers to ensure that the teachers understand the, uh, the history of the student, your child, and what is necessary to um, provide a smooth transition out of special education. And then again, we are looking at, does your child require testing accommodations and um, what those are and that they're clearly documented and shared with the team. Next slide, please. I'm going to jump in with a question if that's all right with you, Michelle. Yes, um, please. Great, Julie, also feel free to chime in here. The question is, are these declassification plans in writing and a copy provided to the parents? So for the one year after, um, so if we were to decide in May that your child will be declassified as of June 30th, and we decide that your child needs a year of declassification support, yes, that is a written plan. Parents receive a copy of that plan, and teachers also receive a copy of that plan. Um, if, and we're going to talk about this later, if testing accommodations are determined that they need to continue past the one year of declassification support, we have um, an internal uh, documentation process that lists the testing accommodations that are shared with the teachers. The parent, of course, may have a copy of this plan. You can certainly ask for it. Um, we don't routinely give a copy of the, the uh, testing accommodations to the parents, but that is something that we share with teachers so they are aware. So it's really probably a school district um, process. Uh, the only thing I'd wanna add to that too is that um, when, if the CSE makes a determination to declassify, they also have to issue a prior written notice to the parent. Um, anytime, really almost anytime a CSE meets it, there's usually a prior written notice that results from it. If there is any change to the IEP, including we're going to find that you're no longer eligible for services. So prior written notice is pretty important um, because it, it, requires a school district to identify the specific action it is taking or not taking. For example, if you asked for a particular service and the, and the district said the CSE uh, district's determination was no, um, that, that would have to be identified in this document. Um, but it also requires um, the uh, district to identify what, what did we talk about? What did we consider and what did we rely on when we were making this decision? So um, when we're speaking about declassification, that prior written notice is gonna be very important because it's gonna identify the very specific um, information, evaluations, um, maybe comments, observations that were relied on in making the decision um, and whether any other things were considered, including whether de declassification support services were needed. So, um, so that's something to, to keep in mind, but there is a written um, IEP. It's a declassification IEP. That's what a lot of people refer it to, refer to it as. Great, thank you so much. And we also got another question. It asks, how long does the district have to send parents a declassification letter? Mm. Uh, that is a, a really good question um, because as many of you know, um, many, many parents know, when we run our annual review meetings, we have, we typically run from February to May. It's a very short um, time span considering the number of IEPs that we um, review and process. So 
the key piece with, as Julie was talking about, the prior written notice, a change cannot be made until the parent has received that prior written notice and has an opportunity to act on it. So our goal, uh, let's say we have a meeting in May and your child is recommended for declassification effective September 1st, you would receive that prior written notice well before the um, declassification document is implemented. Uh, if <clears throat> you have a declassification meeting, let's say in January, um, I can speak for Shenandoah, our goal is to have that meeting processed and have that notice to you within one or two weeks of the meeting, which would be, again, prior to the um, recommendation being implemented and also prior to the board acting on that recommendation. We aim for five to seven days. Great. Thank you so much. Julie, is there anything you would like to add or can we move on to no. that? No, we can move on. Great. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so testing accommodations are one of the most important components uh, to the declassification process, uh, especially if you have students who are older. Often if you have a child who is um, only receiving related services uh, such as speech, OTPT, and we declassify in second grade, this won't be an, a, an issue for you most likely. Um, but when we look at declassifying students who have learning, who had learning disabilities or an other, other health impairment, testing accommodations are very important. And they are often, um, I think, one of the most concerning aspects um, from a parent point of view, because we want um, our students to be able to show everything that they know. And often the testing process can get in the way of that. So what you need to know is that your child continues to be eligible for those testing accommodations when they don't have an IEP. Um, and that is, those testing accommodations are good for everything. They're good for classroom tests. They're good for New York State tests. They're good for Regents exams, um, AP tests, SATs, and also tests in college. Now there is the caveat with the SAT is that um, any testing accommodation, whether your child has an IEP, a 504, or a declassification document, they must be approved by the college board. What I will tell you about that is I've seen, uh, I, I've seen a, a lot more flexibility with the college board in the last five years in terms of what they are approving for testing accommodations, and that is very good. Um, it used to be difficult for even students with IEPs to uh, receive that eligibility letter from them, uh, but that is much better now. And the process varies school to school, but you will work with your school psychologist or if a school has a testing coordinator, you'll want to start working with them in ninth grade to apply for those testing accommodations through the college board because there is paperwork and a process that has to be followed. Uh, and then in college, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about this again later, um, your child continues, um, depending on the, the college your child attends and the time of declassification, your child will continue to have access, uh, access to their testing accommodations. And we will talk about that more later. We received another um, question in the chat that says, what if your child is recommended for declassification, but you didn't receive PWN after several requests, you get PWN back dated and the IEP meeting date, and it has no supporting documentation? Um, that is a call to the director of special education, and you should be having you, you should have a discussion with them about that because that would not be uh, the proper procedure. Correct. I'm going to get into that too a little bit in the next phase of um, like what options you have if if you disagree with the decision or the process that was used for the decision. Um, we were going to sort of transition off 
right now. Um, and I, Michelle, thank you so much for providing that um, grounding, well grounding um, <laughs> in, in the process. But it is really important to understand the process because that process is, is the process that we're looking at every time we're deciding if a child continues to be eligible or not. So it's good to understand all the components. Um, I wanted to say just in, in regard to testing accommodations that um, this slide says declassified students are eligible to receive testing accommodations. I think that that's true in, the, in, the, in that year, but when we go beyond that, we really need to be doing um, an analysis under 504. Um, and so I'm gonna go into that a little bit more about if a child's eligible under 504, then they, they very likely are, are eligible to receive testing accommodations if, if the disability impacts their ability to take tests. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more and that's actually a great transition or segue into the next slide. Um, Cause we thought we would um, focus the next, so Helen, you can flip the slide. Um, we thought we would focus the next um, part of this discussion on common questions that people have about declassification um, and uh, how that plays out in college um, ultimately. So we're going to ask questions such as, and I have to move my screen a little bit, does the classified student automatically get a 504 plan? What if I disagree with the declassification decision? If, is the declassification process different for preschool children? Can a declassified student become eligible for special ed again? And can a declassified student obtain accommodations in college or post-secondary education? So we're gonna just take those one at a time. So you can flip it, Ellen or Helen. All right, so um, is this, if the student's declassified, does the student automatically get a 504 plan? Um, I, we put this in there because this is like one of those uh, myths that is out there. It's like, oh yes, you automatically qualify for a 504 plan when in fact you don't. Um, and this issue was squarely looked at by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a federal court um, that has jurisdiction over all of us. So we all have to kind of abide by that. Only the Supreme Court of the United States could um, contradict that. Um, but the Second Circuit said, no, you have to really look at them as two different things. And while it is true that almost always a student who has been eligible um, under IDEA and has an IEP would be eligible for, for um, 504 accommodations. But in this instance, we have to separate the two and, and look at the differences between the two. So we have a student who's declassified is that student gonna get a 504 plan? Um, a 504 plan, um, just so that you understand, is, is geared towards um, leveling the playing field for students with disabilities. So um, while we look at special education as specialized instruction that helps remediate, helps a child catch up or build skills that are, are impaired because of disability, when we're looking at 504, we're looking at just leveling the playing field. What does this child need in order to access education and all of the educational and school opportunities that are available? So, I mean, a really um, easy way to think about this is the ramp, right? If a child uses a wheelchair and they need a ramp to get into the school to access education, that's, that's the type of, of thing we're looking at when we're talking about 504. But similarly, if a student has ADHD, for example, and has a hard time maintaining focus for a long period of time, then they may need extra time on tests because to level the playing field. So I can show what I know. I love that term, um, Michelle. But I can show what I know if I have enough time to be able to take some breaks so that I can refocus and move forward. So for that child, the ramp is, is then testing accommodation. So we just need to be thinking about that in, in across all areas. A child may need help, um, not only with testing accommodations or physical access, um, but there might be other things they need like assistive technology um, or a behavior support plan or something along those lines that gives them equal access. In other words, we're not remediating or building skills, we're just equalizing the access. Um, so there is different um, eligibility criteria for 504 um, and IDEA. 
Um, and I think it's important to understand the differences so that you do understand that if, if your child is declassified or even if your child just has a 504 right now, um, but you're concerned about getting accommodations in college and, and beyond, um, it's good to understand the difference between these two. So um, as Michelle had detailed earlier, when we're looking at IDEA eligibility, we're really looking at um, of, of having, having an impairment that fits within 13 different categories of disability and they're, they're very broad, broad. But not only do you have that disability, but it, it, it's to the, to the extent that it has an adverse impact on your performance such that you actually need special education services in order to make progress. Um, that's, that's a very, um, you know, it, it can be a tricky analysis, right? Because we can all agree and disagree about is the child making progress and how much progress is necessary. But typically that the crux of it is we're really looking at, do we need special education services or related services in order for that child to benefit from education? Where when we look at 504, the idea again is on access. So what we're looking at is areas of deficit. How impaired is the person in regard to a specific area? Um, is it a substantial impairment that requires um, leveling of the playing field? So is the impairment, the mobility impairment significant, significant enough that we would build a ramp or have a ramp in place or give access to a ramp? to a child, um, and that's just using, again, that very simple um, an, um, example that I'm using. But so we are looking at, first of all, is there some kind of a physical or mental impairment? Um, and does that impairment, and here's the key language, substantially limit um, a major life activity? Um, there are many major life activities um, that are recognized by the courts and in statute um, learning is definitely a major life activity. Um, huh, who did that? We seem to have someone trying to use the annotation feature. I put in the chat that when you use the annotation feature, everyone um, sees it. So if you could not um, do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Ah, it looks like even though this is a protected account, we have, what do you think, Helen? This is a protected account. I'm just gonna pause here because I've had circumstances where some very obnoxious stuff has come on board um, and I just don't wanna, um, I think Helen's probably busy trying to address this. Well, what we could do is this, while she's working on addressing it, is <clears throat> try not to pay attention to the screen and listen carefully to my voice. <laughs> um, not everybody's favorite activity, but something you can think about. Um, so we're looking at under 504, a substantial limitation on a major life activity. <clears throat> such as learning. And the student needs not remediation, but some kind of accommodation that will give that student equal access um, to the um, school opportunity, whether that's classroom instruction, taking a test, um, social support, um, help in um, participating in a particular class, um, in going on field trips and participating in after school activities. Um, those are all the kinds of areas that we can look at because a student under the law has the opportunity, a student with a disability has to have equal opportunity to access um, all the benefits that would be available in education. So Helen, if you can, we're gonna flip the screen. All right, so Helen is in control of the screen. Um, so the next question, and I can actually speak this, so I'm just gonna speak and I'm sorry you don't have this. We will definitely make this recording and this uh, presentation available after uh, this, this um, 
you know, afterwards. But if I disagree with a declassification decision, what, what are my options? What is it that I can do? Um, so the first thing to do is, is make sure that you have expressed what your concerns are to the CSE. So let's say, for example, that you went to an annual meeting, the, the district is recommending that your child be declassified. They talked about why um, they thought so. You go home, you get a prior written notice. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe you have time to review those evaluations. Um, and then you look at it and say, um, you know, I don't agree with this. I, I'm looking at my child's reports from this, or I'm looking at um, his IEP, or I'm looking at what my child is doing in front of me when they're attempting to do their homework. And this just doesn't make sense to me. My suggestion would be first, talk it out. So try to give the, the um, district a call. I'd request a CSE meeting and, and for the purpose of expressing those concerns that you, you have, if you haven't had the opportunity to express them before. If you did express everything at that CSE meeting, then you know I think I'd say you guys are at an impasse, the school, the parent is at an impasse, and we might wanna be looking at other options. But for this, for this, just make sure there's a discussion before we start taking um, a more formal approach. Um, and it is important also that, that um, parents review the information that is provided to them um, and that they have um, an ability to understand any evaluations that were done. So um, there should have been evaluations done. Typically there are if we decide that a child no longer needs services. Um, so, and, and we wanna be able to make sure that the parent understands what those evaluations. Um, most of us do not, um, are not uh, licensed psychologists or licensed school psychologists. And so it may be difficult for us to understand an evaluation. So making sure you have the opportunity to understand what things really mean is important. If you feel like the evaluation isn't accurate, <clears throat> you feel like it wasn't done right, it wasn't sufficient, or that the recommendation just doesn't make sense to you or is inaccurate, you have the right to request an independent um, educational evaluation. You can flip it, um, Helen. So <clears throat> it's interesting. I. I wanna talk a little bit about independent education evaluations because we had a very recent decision, again, by the Second Circuit, um, that kind of changed the way that some of us have thought about um, independent um, educational evaluations, which I'm gonna to refer to as an IEE. Um, so I think it's important to talk about that, but um, just the basics of IEEs, when the school district conducts an evaluation, such as a triennial evaluation, the one that happens every three year, three years or one that was recently done and is the basis uh, perhaps for the recommendation for declassification. Um, a parent can request an independent educational evaluation and the school district has to pay for it. Um, the way that we do that is that the parent should be making the request in writing. I disagree with the evaluation and you know, date it, whatever the name of it is, um, you need to put that in writing. Um, I disagree with that and I'm requesting an independent evaluation at district expense. So when we do that, um, the district really has two choices and they have to do it without delay. Um, one is to say, okay, yes, you can get an independent evaluation and we agree to pay for it. Um, the school can put some um, limitations on that. There are some recognized limitations. Um, typically the um, the evaluation has to be done, um, should be costing what is typical or average for the geographic area. So for example, and I'm just grabbing at numbers here, but let's just say that um, a psychoeducational evaluation in this area typically costs $2,000. Um, that same evaluation, if we went to Boston or New York City might be considerably higher than that. And so the district really only has to look at what um, the going rate is in, in the local area. Um, and it also has to be done by a professional with the qualifications to conduct the type of evaluation that we're talking about. So, so those, those limitations can be put on, um, and, and also the district can provide you with a list of people who that they, 
they work with or they recommend, but you are not limited to that list. You can choose someone off that list um, as long as the person has the qualifications to meet it. What I wanted to talk about that was different here is for many practitioners, I mean, at least from my perspective, and I think school districts too, our understanding was <clears throat> whenever the district conducts an evaluation that the parent disagrees with, the parent has the, then the right to ask request for an IEE. Um, what the Second Circuit said was um, the parent was challenging the denial of, so this, let me back up. So the school district had done a functional behavior assessment and the parent disagreed with the functional behavior assessment. Now, a functional behavior assessment is, is an evaluation of behavior. They look at multiple sources of data um, and come to some conclusions um, or hypotheses about the cause of behavior. So in this case, the parent disagreed with the FBA and requested um, an independent functional behavior assessment as an independent evaluation. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, again, a very high and controlling court, said an FBA is not, is not contemplated or does not fall within the meaning of an, of an evaluation for the purposes of an independent educational evaluation. The court said that it's really sort of a sub subcategory. Um, it's part of an overall evaluation. It's not an in evaluation in and of itself. Um, that's very disturbing to many of us because um, FBAs uh, are often needed when there are behavior issues and behavior issues are also often what are at issue when um, we're talking about more restrictive settings for clients, um, kids being removed from the classroom for disciplinary reasons, um, all kinds of kind of hurtful, harmful things that we want to try to avoid for students. Um, so this was kind of disturbing. However, um, I think that there is, you know, the way that I'm looking at it in practice, and I really haven't seen any new cases on this yet. Um, it was a very recent decision. If if, if the court is going to look at an FBA as part of a comprehensive evaluation, then I think we have the right to ask for an IEE of the comprehensive evaluation that was done. Um, and I, I, that is the way I'm going to be playing it. So Michelle talked about the psychologist may decide yeah, we need to update our, our evaluation every three years in this area or that area, um, but maybe not all areas. But if, if we are supposed to be uh, evaluating all areas of suspected disability um, and behavior is one of them or speech delay or OT or whatever, then that is part of a comprehensive evaluation. Um, and that then would be the basis for an IEE. Um, the fact that those subparts are part of a larger evaluation. So you'd be asking for a larger evaluation. Um, that may not be crystal clear to everybody. It isn't crystal clear to me either, but until we see how this plays out um, in the courts, it's going to be, um, it's going to be uh, kind of hit or miss on how people are, are interpreting it. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention because it is a very different approach or thought about IEEs um, than, the, than we previously worked under. And Julie, I just wanna jump in um, from my perspective, I totally agree with you. Um, the way that I've interpreted that ruling is that any and all evaluations that took place either at the initial classification meeting or at any subsequent reevaluation um, meeting would constitute evaluations that one could request an IE for. Sorry to end that with a preposition. Um, so the when the I, I, I interpret it as if you're two years in and you're requesting a supplemental speech and language evaluation that doesn't have didn't have to do with the initial classification, that would not be an evaluation subject to an IEE. That was so that's my interpretation as well. Right, um, and that that is that is troubling from the uh, student advocacy side um, to be thinking about that because um, what is the recourse then um, for a parent? I mean, the purpose of IEE, um, and I'm not I'm not disputing that interpretation. That is an interpretation. 
But I think it flies in the face of the purpose of the IEE, which was to level the procedural safeguard to level the playing field for parents um, who do not have the expertise and probably the resources to obtain an evaluation. And so Congress said, look, um, we understand it is a room that is controlled by a lot of different professionals. And one way to provide a check and balance is to make sure that parents could get a, a second opinion, essentially, if they had a basis for disagreeing with the original evaluation. Um, and remember, that can be challenged because the district can say, no, you don't have a right to an IE. We did a very thorough, comprehensive evaluation that we stand by, and no, we're not paying for it. Now, they have to file a hearing, you know, file for hearing to, to maintain that position, but there is, a, there is some protection for school districts as well. So that is where, you know, I, I know that um, a number of advocates have asked for a rehearing um, by the Second Circuit. Um, that's granted in very limited circumstances, but it could be here because it is quite a departure from the um, typical thinking on, on evaluations. And don't get me wrong either, the Second Circuit recognized the importance of an FBA. Um, but when they were looking at, does it fall under the category of an IEE in and of itself, the answer was no, it had to be part of a comprehensive. So I, I, think, I think your interpretation is flies um, under the current understanding of this, but I also think there are, there are legitimate challenges to it. Um, and that may be asking for a comprehensive evaluation as an independent evaluation. There's a, I don't wanna go, I'm getting really in the weeds on this and I don't know who's on the phone, but there is a decision um, that came out from the um, Office of Special Education Programs in the US Department of Education. Um, I'm gonna say six years back probably um, where they had said that you would have the right to an independent evaluation if the school district failed to conduct an evaluation they should have conducted. So um, I think there's that piece out there also. If, if, if the school district is supposed to be evaluating all areas of suspected disability at the outset, you know, initial in eligibility determination, and they only do a psychoeducational when in fact parent has said, oh, behavior is a problem or speech is a problem or communication or whatever. Um, under this um, interpretation by, by the US Department of Education, you would have the right to get an independent evaluation in the area that was not evaluated. So I think that's a matter of BAUS, I think B-A-U-S. And I can share that in the, um, in the materials too, if anybody wants it. But, um, so I think that that comes into play here too. It's possible even that the US Department of Education might provide further clarification um, about what independent educational evaluations mean. So it's an interesting discussion and I wish I could give you clear guideposts or understanding, but it, it really is up in the air right now. But anyways, that would be other than you know, having a conversation with the CSE and everybody discussing all of the evidence available about the child's progress um, and need for special education services, I think um, looking at an IEE is, is one of the, um, I'm gonna say easiest and um, less formal ways of addressing a, a disagreement about a declassification decision. Um, however, there are, and you can flip it now, um, Helen, there are other options that would be available to um, uh, parents if they disagreed with a declassification decision. Um, one would be a state complaint. Um, and this is a, you know, a link, there's samples on the state education uh, website and also um, more information in special education in plain language, which is a, um, plain language guide to special education that the, this task force puts out. Um, it's available on the task force website. Um, state complaints though, typically are best when we're looking at procedural violations. So earlier someone had asked about 
Um, I didn't receive a prior written notice. I haven't received any documentation about this decision. Um, that, that is a procedural error, right? You know, as Michelle talked about, you're really required to issue a prior written notice before you're making any changes. Um, and there's requirements for what that's supposed to look like. Um, there is supposed to be a CSE meeting before we have a declassification and we're supposed to consider multiple um, sources of information when we're talking about declassification. So if those things didn't happen, those are procedural errors. Like those procedures are in place to make sure the process is accurate and that parents have a meaningful um, opportunity to participate. So for that kind of thing, filing a state complaint could be very helpful. Um, you absolutely do not need an attorney to file a state complaint. Um, there is a sample form, like I said, on the website. Um, it gives instructions on how to, to make a state complaint. Um, and what happens if you file a state complaint is that uh, the uh, quality assurance um, division of state ed is going to conduct an investigation. They're going to ask you questions. They're going to ask the school for a response. Um, they may try to work things out um, or they may make a finding, but they kind of take the process um, out of your hands to the extent that you don't have to say they violated, you know, eight NYCRR. They're going to look at, if you say, I didn't, they made this decision without me attending a CSE meeting and without me getting a prior written notice, they're going to translate that into legal um, allegations. And then they have 60 days to make a determination on whether that occurred. Um, if they do make a finding that um, the complaint was substantiated, then they um, will impose um, corrective actions on the part of the school district um, to make sure that their, you know, that the, your issue is resolved as well as um, if there's a systemic problem there, um, they will make um, requirements for corrective action to show that the school's um, complying in the future. And Julie, if I could just jump in real quick. Um, if you disagree, you don't, you don't even have to go through the full state complaint process to, to get some advice. You are always able to call the New York State Education Department, Office of Quality Assurance, and talk to your district's regional associate. So for example, um, if you uh, have a concern with something that one of my CSE chair people did or didn't do, or if you just have a question about, is this okay? And, or I'm not feeling good about this, you can call the office, the CEQA office, and you'll say, I'm from Shenandoah, and you will get Janet Wolf. And she's our regional associate who will then talk to you about what happened and did you talk to the district. So please know that that office just in general is there as a resource without going through a full formal complaint process. And they will help direct you in what the next steps are. And they will also reach out to your district and say, I want you to know that I received this call and here's the concern and here's the parent's perspective. Um, perception of what happened. And that's often a good way to work things out before they get to a more formal uh, process. That's right. And that I, I agree with you. And I, and that would be an option is calling your regional associate. Um, I think there are, I think regional associates have done a great job in many cases. I don't think they're all equal. I'm just saying that um, across the state. Um, and I, I think it's a good place to start. I think it's good to say that you're considering filing a complaint and then, re, you know, share that. I'm considering filing a complaint. I thought I would reach out first and, and then have the conversation with the regional associate. Um, obviously, because CEQA has to investigate these. They have an interest in trying to resolve complaints so they don't have to go through this whole formal process. Um, but, but I think it does help to say I'm considering filing a complaint because I think it, it forces them to understand. Um, and I don't mean any disrespect to the CEQA folks because mo you know, but for all intents and purposes, they're, they're trying very hard and they can be very overwhelmed. Um, especially now that we don't have the parent centers really around to help parents through this process. Um, so in any event, um, I just think it's worthwhile to pre preface it that way. Like I said, it, a state complaint is not a difficult thing to file. And um, so even if you're not sure if you would file or not, I think it's 
it conveys that you mean business and you're concerned about this. Um, another option is mediation. Um, mediation um, is definitely undervalued and such a great resource um, for everyone involved in this process. Um, unfortunately, as we already talked about, sometimes it is contentious. There can be a whole history of nastiness um, unfortunately, and poor communication between schools and parents. And people get really entrenched in their positions. Um, there's just so many reasons that that happens, but that communication breakdown can be super damaging and it can very easily take the focus away from the student and on, and, and the focus becomes more of this, this battle um, of wills, let's say. So mediation is a great way if there's communication breakdown to start restoring that communication because mediators are actually trained to build communication, build understanding of different positions um, and they can be very effective at it. It is a voluntary process. Um, it's a free process. It's by people who are trained um, to understand special education issues um, and it's not binding. So if you participate in mediation and you can't come to a decision, you know, there's no agreement fine, then you can move on and pursue um, these, other, these other options that are available to you. But um, it can be a very restorative uh, process and one that is usually quite successful. I think there's a really, I wish I could say, I'm feeling like 80 something percent success rate um, when we use that process. So something to think about. Um, and then obviously, we can get much more formal and file a due process complaint. Um, the IDEA gives parents the right to um, ask a hearing officer to make a decision um, whether the district's position is, um, was consistent with the law or not. Um, this is a little bit more formal process. It doesn't require an attorney, but I, as an attorney, I'm telling you that I, I, I would recommend that you have an attorney involved. Um, if at all possible, um, if you are successful in, in that um, hearing, the uh, school district would have to pay for your attorney's fees for most things, not all, but for most, and an attorney could explain that to you. Um, but it is more formal. So we're gonna file a complaint. Um, there's requirements for the complaint. There is a sample complaint um, on the state ed website. Um, the school district's going to have a chance to respond to that, and they will um, then have a hearing. So it would be there would be an administrative judge. Um, there's a hearing. It takes place usually at the school. It's not like in a courtroom or anything. Um, and it, it the there's the rules of evidence and other kinds of things that you see on TV in courtrooms are loosely applied. Um, so, but it is a chance, um, you know, the district has the burden of showing that their decision was consistent with the law um, and you put on evidence um, supporting your position that it wasn't. So that is an option that could get there. The one thing that is um, helpful about a due process complaint if, if other things have not been successful is there is a requirement that we have a resolution process um, within a couple weeks. And that means we're sitting down, everybody knows it's serious now because a due process complaint is on the table. Most people don't wanna go to a hearing. Um, and so that, uh, that pressure or that context and environment might um, help um, make the parties more willing to come up with a solution that works for both. All right. Um, are declassification procedures the same for preschool students? They are, um, and the, the same um, protections that are there for, pre the, the, for school age students are also applicable. Um, so you could ask for an, an outside evaluation, you could talk to CEQA, um, you could file a complaint mediation and so forth. Um, I, would, I want you to think about this too though, um, I added this question because we often hear that students who may have received preschool services um, then have the meeting when they're transitioning to kindergarten and the school district saying, let's declassify for now, see how the child does in, in the school setting, um, in the kindergarten setting. And we can always reassess at that time 
and determine does this child um, need an IEP um, as a school age student with a disability. Um, there are um, some districts where that is almost routine, that, that is the approach. Um, and that is concerning uh, because it really needs to be an individual determination. Um, and so those same considerations need to be um, made if we're deciding to, to classify a student when they're transitioning to school age um, to kindergarten. That means we need to be looking at all of the evidence that's available to us. Um, how is the child done on the goals on their preschool IEP? Um, what are the evaluations showing? Um, this is a, one of those important times that are a reminder of why it's important that we have all the people at the CSE that we do. So the CSE, you know, meetings require that there's a whole host of people, um, including the CSE chair, a regular education teacher, a special education teacher, um, related service providers, the parent, the student, if appropriate. Um, so one of the reasons we have all those people at the table is because they all have information that and perspectives and expertise that not that they can contribute to this whole discussion about what works for the student. And so having a kindergarten teacher, a regular ed teacher who's going to be teaching this child in kindergarten present at the table adds that insight of, you know what, I'm, we're, you're talking about these kinds of skills or these kinds of skill deficits that is or isn't going to be an issue in kindergarten or yes, we can do that. Um, we can alter or modify the curriculum um, through, um, through just general education procedures as opposed to uh, special education procedures. But um, it's kind of, that's why it's important to have all those people at the table and also to ask questions. So, gee, you know, you're, you're, I, I know my child is still struggling with, with communication. My child just can't express himself or herself. How is that going to impact them in, um, in kindergarten? So just thinking about those kinds of questions um, can be very helpful in deciding whether we want to declassify a child. Um, another solution to think about, because um, in my opinion, it is easier to um, declassify a child than it is to establish eligibility once again. Um, one thing to think about is maybe um, we meet again, the CSC meets again um, in three months or six months at the end of the first or second quarter, and then looks at how is the child done and is declassification um, makes sense at this point because the child's really transitioned fine. So that might be something that we want to think about. Um, and then um, can a declassified student be eligible for special ed in the future? Absolutely. Um, a, you know, a ch kids with disabilities change every minute. Um, so it's no surprise that a child may be doing um, well or may need preschool services. First couple of years of elementary school goes quite well, but then there's then we're starting to see a gap that may be occurring um, in any of the areas, academic, social, um, physical, whatever. Um, so certainly you can make another referral to the CSE and the CSE has to make that same um, uh, eligibility determination um, based on evaluations. So um, there's a 60 day time period that applies for that. Um, in other words, from the date that you consent to an, an evaluation, there's 60 days for the CSE to meet and determine if the child's eligible and if so, to implement that IEP. Um, but I, you know, so that is an option and you're not forever, forever barred. All right, next slide. All right, um, just, I talked a little bit earlier because um, we just alluded to this. It's a very common question um, that parents are concerned, hey, you know, my child had an IEP or a 504 plan in high school. They got a variety of accommodations, um, usually test accommodations, but maybe other kinds of accommodations as well. Am I gonna be able to get these um, in college or any other post-secondary educational setting? Um, the answer is, it depends. Um, it depends because um, when we 
The 504, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act applies to individuals from birth to old age. Okay, so that doesn't change um, when there's nothing about it. The eligibility, anything doesn't change from when a child is early education all the way um, all the way through life. IDEA does change. Um, IDEA is in place until a child is 21 or graduates, whichever or receives a um, diploma, whichever comes first. So after the after a child, after the school year in which the child turns 21 expires, there's no more IDEA. There's no more IEPs. There's nothing like that. So when we are looking at college, we are looking only at 504 um, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is has very similar criteria to the 504. So I just focus on 504. Um, but we want to be looking at then, does the child um, uh, qualify under 504? Um, I already went through with, through with you how we make that determination of whether a child applies, but I, I just, it's that same sort of thing that's going to happen. Now, what typically will happen if you apply to a college, let's, let's just say we apply to a community college, um, it is very, they're going to look at what evidence you have of disability. And in most instances, if there's a recent IEP or 504 plan that provides certain accommodations, that's going to be good evidence um, to that institution um, that you are eligible for accommodations. Um, but it is possible that they may require more documentation. Um, if there was an evaluation that was done in the last couple of years of high school, they're probably going to look at that. Um, but if not, then we might be, might be required to look at some of different, um, some more recent testing um, or evidence. You can flip the slide. Helen, I thank you. So um, I've just laid out kind of the process that you go through to obtain accommodations at college. I will tell you, um, I sit on a um, council on post-secondary education. Um, lots of great people on this council from all different uh, perspectives. But one of the frustrations that we've identified is that there's very little uniformity among colleges and places of secondary um, education. So there's like different requirements to get accommodations in almost all of them. And we're really trying to look at a standardized process and standardized levels of evidence um, so that it isn't such a struggle for students. Because the key here is this, there's no, there's no IDEA, which means there's no child find. Um, there's nobody who's going to be looking out at the college student and saying, hey, do you have a disability? Do you have a disability? We have an obligation to support you. No, the obligation is on the student, um, any, anybody who supports the student to affirmatively go out and try to get these services. Um, so the best thing to do is to reach out to um, the disability um, services office at the particular institution. Um, every institution has one and they're all called um, different things. There's some examples of ones here. Um, they are gonna ask for certain uh, paperwork and accommodation or, or paperwork or documentation of disability um, and the types of um, accommodations you want. You can flip it, Ellen. Um, then there's going to be some kind of a meeting. They're going to make some kind of um, determination. There will be an agreement about what accommodations you're entitled to. And then again, in most instances, it's up to the student to share those accommodations with their professors um, so that they're, they're getting those accommodations met. Um, very different than what we would experience um, in, in, you know, school age students. All right, that's it, I think, Helen. Yes. I'm sorry I talk so fast. So are there any questions? Thank you guys so much. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, oh, my camera's not on, I'm sorry. Um, if anybody has any questions that on the call, if you wanna unmute and then you can ask your question or you can send your question through the chat and Helen can share. Has anything come through that we were holding on to, Helen? There was one question, I believe it was answered. 
but I will ask it again. It says, can you request evaluations in all necessary areas of suspected disability? And if you are denied, what is the recourse? So I assume this question is for uh, an initial. And yes, you absolutely can request evaluations in, in all areas that you are concerned about. And furthermore, you may have a CSC meeting in which, um, let's say you didn't specifically request an OT evaluation to look at fine motor and the CSE meets and there's discussion and you may say, well, well, wait a minute, I'm concerned about fine motor too. We need a fine motor evaluation. The CSE then needs to um, get permission from you to complete that evaluation and then they would need to complete the evaluation and the CSE would need to meet again as an initial eligibility meeting. And the person added in the chat that what they meant was for declassification, not the initial. Ah, okay. That's a little bit of a, um, of a trickier question. So I would say personally that if a parent, if we were looking at a declassification assessment and a let's say a parent requested a speech and language evaluation and the student never received speech and language evaluation, um, we would probably have a conversation about that, but I would never deny a parent a request for an evaluation. So personally, that is my philosophy on that. Great, thank you. There's no other questions in the chat. Um, this person added that they had received OT, PT, and speech language in the past. Helen, what, what is the question? They're, they're trying to determine, so the, the CSE has made a declassification determination. Um, and that means that, and this, I mean, the purpose of the evaluations isn't, it isn't a fishing expedition either. So I think when, when Michelle says, I mean, if, if the idea is we're declassifying your child, we feel they no longer need that level of support of, of specialized instruction. Um, I don't, I, I would not be recommending to a client that we um, go on a fishing expedition by asking for evaluations in areas that we've never noticed before or have never been identified to the CSE before. Um, I just, I, I think the energy would be better placed at figuring out what declassification services and accommodations might be appropriate for the student or figuring out, um, have we considered everything that's available to us to make this come to this conclusion that this child doesn't need um, specialized instruction anymore. Yeah, and it, they added that they are areas that had been identified previously. Yeah, it's I, that's still not enough information for me um, to make to make that decision. I mean, remember, well, if what isn't often talked about, especially coming from an advocacy perspective, is that special education is. It means that a student has a significant disability, that they really need this help in order to make progress. And we all want what's best for our, our kids. There's no doubt about it. And if we can give them supports, we're giving them supports. That's what we want. That's what we do as parents. We, you know, we get that. But at the same time, there's also this standard, there's a legal standard in the law um, that we also have to be mindful of. And I think I respect the fact that Michelle early on talked about the goal of wanting to kids to be as independent as possible and develop compensatory strategies, but to be supported in doing that. And so that's why there is this transition time of, of making sure that students have declassification services, that someone is keeping eyeballs on this student and the fact that you can always re-refer a child um, to, to special education. So I think, I don't know if that answers the, the person's questions, but that's my two cents. I think the other thing that's important to emphasize um, is especially in today's day of APPR, 
classroom teachers want their students to be successful. And if they have a student in front of them who is not successful uh, and, and the committee is considering declassification, I have yet to meet a teacher who is not vocal about their opinion that this child continues to require specialized instruction. Um, I'm not saying it probably has never happened, but um, what I see from uh, the meetings that I have at my district, teachers are very strong advocates for their students. Great, thank you. And there's no more questions in the chat. Like Sherry said, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask that now. You can unmute yourself by pressing star six. Um, and we'll hang around for a couple more minutes to see if any questions come through. I also noticed from looking at the list of participants that Audrey Frank is here and she is one of our newer members. So I apologize, Audrey, for uh, missing you earlier um, in the list, but uh, Audrey is one of our newer members of the Capital District Special Ed Task Force. So thanks for joining us as well. All right, it's pretty quiet. So I will end by saying thank you to our presenters. Everyone who has attended, you will be getting a um, link to an evaluation. Please fill it out. We read every single one. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And thank you for putting up with a little bit of um, technical difficulties in the middle there. We'll work with our graphic design media person to try and scrub that out before um, putting this out on YouTube. So thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.